Ignition sequence start. 50 years ago. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. It happened. Liftoff on Apollo 11. A dream Perfect. turned into reality. The angle has landed. The first man walked on the moon. Man on the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Tonight, we celebrate the accomplishment. The three men on Apollo 11. We copy you down, Eagle. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes from the winner. And the 400,000 people who made the trip possible. We mark this milestone by remembering our past, embracing our future, and Houston's role in it. One giant leap, the moon and beyond. Presented by Space Center Houston. Good evening, I'm Len Cannon. And I'm Mia Gradney. On this day in 1969, the whole nation was captivated by a monumental moment in the space race. Make no mistake, it took a lot to get a man on the moon. Money, commitment, passion, and the man you're about to meet inside Mission Control. Okay, people, listen up. He's a living American legend, immortalized in Hollywood film. I believe this is going to be our finest hour. This room here has been home. From inside Mission Control, former NASA flight director Gene Kranz helped land American men on the moon. 50 years after the historic Apollo 11 landing, Kranz is back in the room where humanity's greatest feat unfolded. When I walk into the room, I don't have to relive it. As soon as I walk into this room, this is, this is, seems crazy, but I hear things. Kranz was already a rising star at NASA when he heard President John F. Kennedy challenge the nation. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It was a great time for America, and Kennedy's speech, I think, ignited the fire. Let's go do it. Next stop for them, the moon. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Kranz watched Apollo 11 blast off to space. Now you're accelerating, accelerating, accelerating down there. And you can almost feel it. I believe 100% that we're going to be successful. We're going to land that crew on the moon. You're looking good. Four days later, on July 20th, we are all arrived here uh, early dawn. Kranz and his team of controllers walked into mission control with a lunar landing within reach. Nobody can come in or out until we have either landed, we have crashed, or we have boarded. Those are the only three outcomes from now on. And it's now between me and my team and the crew on the spacecraft, they are the only people that exist in the universe. For the next few hours, the Apollo 11 astronauts faced daunting challenges. Mission Control worked each problem. It was a battle. We had problems with communication, we had problems with navigation, computer program alarms, etc. Every solution got them closer to the surface of the moon. We are going to make this the first man lunar landing. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Drifting, the eagle has landed. With just 17 seconds of fuel left in the tank. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Boy. <laughs> okay, we're gonna be busy for a minute. But the people in the viewing room Recognize we landed and they're stopping and clawing and they're stomping their feet. The world celebrated, but Kranz and his crew still had work to do. Okay, T1, stay no stay, retro, stay, Fido, stay, guidance, stay. We celebrated two hours after the landing. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. The surface appears to be very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Finally looked up and could see the moon up there. You could see the thing up there and say, hey, we just landed in the moon. That's pretty cool. The success of Apollo 11 was way more than cool. It remains the defining moment in human history. People started believing in themselves and what they can do. Now at 85 years old, Cran still finds himself captivated by the moon and its mystery. This NASA giant believes the moon is still calling. To me, uh, uh, it's out there. And it basically says, I'm still here. Come and get me. While Gene Krantz was in mission control, Michael Collins was in orbit around the moon. In his own words, you are about to hear about his experiences and his hopes for the future. I 
I was delighted, extremely pleased with the seat I had. We felt, or at least I felt, the weight of the world on my shoulders. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. It is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. We had our marching orders from the president, and those orders were extremely useful to us as we made our preparations. The appearance of the moon was so different up close than it is uh, the little uh, uh, flat silver uh, sliver in the sky that we see. Out the window, uh, Earth was tiny. Uh, you could obscure it with your thumb if you hold your thumb out at arm's length. Uh, but if you took your thumb away, it just popped right back. It wanted to be noticed. Right, your eagle thumb got. Yeah, you know, I, I get asked uh, whether I feel terribly uh, remiss in not walking on the moon. No, I really, uh, really did not. I, uh, I'd be a liar if, or a fool if I, uh, if I said I thought I had the best seat on Apollo 11. I think they ought to, uh, at the 50th anniversary, consider our future, and I think that our future lies in the direction of the planet Mars. There's hundreds of millions of miles separating the two. Uh, it's about a two-year uh, round trip, uh, and that, of course, makes Apollo uh, seem almost like child's play. Gene Kranz, Michael Collins, and many others all point to one spark for the trip to the moon. A speech by President John F. Kennedy, words connected to Houston in more ways than one. We do not intend to stay behind. Words of President John F. Kennedy inspired the race to land on the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. His words struck a chord and changed not only the future of our country, but Houston. Your city of Houston, with its manned spacecraft center, will become the heart of a large scientific and engineering community. In terms of, you know, sort of instantaneously lighting a fuse, I, I can't think of anything that really quite compares to it. Overnight, right, we became Space City. Melissa Keene, the Rice University historian, takes us beneath the historic halls of Rice University. There's some fantastic stuff in here. And back in time. Here he is entering the stadium. To when in 1962, JFK walked into the football field at Rice University. It was hot. It was hot that day. Yeah, it was hot that day. Space can be explored and mastered. It's a, a who's who of Houston. In this decade, we shall make up. There's Mrs. Hobby. And move ahead. In fact, Houston's most influential pulled the strings to get NASA to set up shop on Rice University's land in Clear Lake. Technical institutions such as Rice will reap the harvest of these gains. You know, the Clear Lake area itself physically was never the same again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? Maybe it's not about why, rather, why not? It's not like some boring policy speech, right? You know, we're gonna, we're all gonna fly to the moon. This country was conquered by those who move forward, and so will space. Turned out the president was right, and the rest, as they say, is history. When Houston became known as Space City and NASA set up shop just outside of town, the astronauts and all of the people working on the space program needed a place to live. And many of them found a home in the Clear Lake community of Timber Cove. So this is Tyler Lake, and this is what originally drew developers. But even developers couldn't imagine what Timber Cove would eventually become, a mostly middle-class neighborhood, but with homeowners who were international celebrities. So originally this whole area was uh, farmland. This marketing brochure from 1958 shows what was coming. The country's manned space flight center. Deborah Griffin, an historian and longtime resident, says among the first homeowners here, 
NASA astronauts. John Glenn and Scott Carpenter chose lots next to one another at the head of the canal. Other pioneering Mercury astronauts, Gus Grissom and Wally Shira, were also next door neighbors who valued their privacy. So they designed these homes with no windows on the front. No windows meant the hordes of camped out camera crews couldn't peek through. I think it's important to remember that the original seven astronauts, they never intended to be famous people. They were military guys. During each space mission, the country waited anxiously for their safe return. Residents here would gather at the neighborhood pool in the shape of the Mercury capsule. When the astronauts were safely back on planet Earth, people would gather at the pool and they'd have a big party. The Apollo missions remain a huge source of pride in this community. I definitely feel like my home is a part of history. Alyssa Emmons lives in the original home of Apollo 13 astronaut Jim Lovell. Old magazine photos of him line her shelves, and she got the surprise of her life when the legendary astronaut knocked on her door. He says, you don't know us, but we used to live here. Um, so immediately, I'm like starstruck and just dumbfounded. So I said, well, come on in, it's your home. <laughs> Lovell was revered on these streets when he came back after that near tragedy from an explosion on the spacecraft. People lined this esplanade, both sides, and they stood in silent testimony to the heroics of not just the astronauts, but all of NASA to get them home safely. Another cherished neighbor, Pete Conrad, the third man to walk on the moon. He was always known as the colorful astronaut. Parties at his backyard pool drew Hollywood movie stars. Raquel Welch swam in this pool. Truman Capote enjoyed a drink. Also in Timber Cove, the late Jack Kinsler, known as NASA's Mr. Fix-It. Sylvia Kinsler is proud of her husband's innovation, one that became iconic. He figured out how to get the American flag to the moon's surface and make it fly. The ideas he came up with. And she has fond memories of that time. Party, party, party. <laughs> lots of fun. Yeah, I said lots of fun. On the successes of the previous flights, the unmanned flights and the manned flights, Apollos 7, 8, 9, and 10, whose crews have done a magnificent job of preparing the way for us. One of the astronauts that paved the way for Armstrong to walk on the moon is Walter Cunningham. He shares his space travels and humble beginnings. But first, astronauts that landed on the moon did bring back some souvenirs. NASA opens up its vault to show us their rock collection. Pad 39A, Kennedy Space Center, July 7th, 1969. The year, the month, almost the moment now when man becomes a creature of two worlds. Apollo 11 will leave for a landing on the moon just nine days from now, if, in that oldest cliche of the space program, if all goes well. Small problems have cropped up. Technicians replaced a bulky inertial measuring unit, the device that tells Apollo where it is and where it's going. The new unit appears to be working perfectly. And President Nixon today bowed to the wishes of Dr. Charles Berry and canceled a pre-launch dinner with the astronauts. It seems that even presidents have germs and they don't want to take any chances with the Apollo 11 crew. The moon landing was one giant leap for mankind and also the space city. Let's break it down. Apollo 11 launched from Kennedy Space Center on July 16th with three astronauts on board, Commander Neil Armstrong, Lunar Module Pilot Buzz Aldrin, and Commander Module Pilot Michael Collins. And this was no easy feat. The mission lasted 195 hours, 18 minutes, and 35 seconds. And the astronauts left behind this small silicone disc that carried one giant message, a goodwill message from the 73 countries on Earth. And hey, you have to bring home a souvenir, right? The astronauts brought back 50 moon rocks. Round trip, the Apollo 11 traveled 1,096,348 miles. Of course, it takes a team to pull off something of this magnitude. More than 400,000 NASA employees helped launch the Apollo 11 mission. And get this, many of them were based right here in the space city. The rocks the Apollo astronauts brought back from the moon are safely stored and studied right here in Houston. So who watches over these priceless items? You're about to meet NASA's real rock star. 
Before you get to see where Andrea Mosey works. You do this every day. You need to suit up. I feel like I'm ready for surgery. <laughs> and then stand back. Mosey's the chief processor and protector of NASA's lunar vault. Under feet of concrete, but sitting higher than a Harvey-like flood, this pristine room is filled with moon rocks and soil and dust, hundreds of pounds brought back to Earth from six Apollo missions. So this is the Apollo 11 cabinet and all of the samples are stored in these trays and they're all sealed. And they stay sealed, safe from Earth's corroding air in these stainless steel containers filled with nitrogen. That is, until they're needed next door. What we do here reflects back to the beginning and for the future. This is the Lunar Lab, where scientists get to work analyzing the impact of things like cosmic wind and solar rays. Here's some moon soil from Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong picked that up? He sure did. This is a rock when they brought it back from the moon. They call this the Genesis rock. It's four billion years old, and it helped us correctly date the Earth's age. That white color, well, that's what you're seeing when you gaze up at the moon. Each rock here has a history, and whatever happens to it in the lunar lab, each test, each cut, it's gonna go right through there, is written down and photographed. This is something that I did back in 1985. The records are meticulous. Because you have to put it back together. It's like a puzzle. You have to know where all the pieces came from. Andrea Mosey showed up at NASA as a high school intern 50 years ago. Here she is opening the same vault door when it was brand new 40 years ago. And you might wonder, after all that time, what's left to learn? But she says modern equipment is revealing new information about these old rocks. When I first started working here, it was like, there is no water on the moon. And so by going over these analyses over the years, a few things changed. NASA shares small samples with scientists all over the world for their research, too. Even so, about 75% of what's in this vault remains untouched. And yet, Mosey is disappointed nothing new has shown up here since 1972. Uh, we only sampled six different locations on the moon, and there's a vast majority area that needs to be sampled. Andrea Mosey wants to see more moon missions, and she dreams about another vault filled with this most precious payload. Yes. I will see it. I'll be here. Not all lunar samples are stored here in Houston. Many years ago, NASA moved some of its moon rocks to White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The agency just plain it's safe, not wanting everything from the moon kept in one place. There are thousands of moon collectors who want a piece of history. The man you're about to meet claims to have the biggest collection of autographs from the first man on the moon. Neil Armstrong is a hero to many, including Anthony Pizzatola. He is the very first human being of this century that is a modern day Christopher Columbus. Anthony Pizzatola says he has the largest collection of Neil Armstrong autographs on the planet. Around 80 photographs and drawings and other items signed by the first man on the moon. He was a very nice man. Uh, if, he if you started talking golf, he would talk all day. But if you really mention too much about space, he got very reserved. This particular photo was signed by Armstrong in Houston in 1999. The moonwalker was throwing out the first pitch for the Astros' final home opener in the Dome. Then he was leaving with Drake McLean. I walked up to him and I said, may I please have an autograph, sir? He recognized me. But he gave me an autograph anyway. This is just a small part of Pizzatola's collection. This is 12 men who walked on the moon. Every item has a story. And if these small metals could talk, they would speak of dusty tranquility base, because that is where Armstrong took them. It went to the moon. It also went on his Gemini flight. He bought the medals from Armstrong's former neighbor. But Armstrong himself refused to charge anyone for an autograph. He says it was never about the money for Armstrong, and Pizzatola says his own collection was never about the money either. But there it is. He plans to donate much of it to Armstrong's alma mater of Purdue University. Astronaut Central. Houston loves being Space City, 
right down to its sports teams. You know, the Astros, the Rockets. But it turns out their names have a bit of a backstory. Space, it is stitched into the fabric of Houston sports. And in the case of one team's nickname, you could say the stars definitely align. But first, let's start with the Astros. Originally the Colt 45s, the team changed its nickname in 1965 when it moved to the Astrodome. Judge Roy Hofheinz, the team's owner at the time, also believed the name Astros was a better fit because of Houston's connection to our country's space program. As for the name Rockets, well, that one, it turned out, was a stroke of luck. The franchise's roots start in 1967, not in Houston, but in San Diego, where Atlas missiles and rocket boosters were being developed. It's how Rockets won a Name the New Team contest there. The San Diego Rockets then hit the floor with their green and yellow uniforms, as well as players like Alvin Hayes and later Calvin Murphy. But not enough people went to the games, and the team was sold to a group of Texas investors who moved the Rockets in 1971 to Houston. Rockets and Astros. While each nickname's path to Houston is unique, the mission remains the same. Four, three, two. Space travel then and now. An Apollo astronaut reflects on the past. <laughs> yes. No matter what we look like, where we came from, what our backgrounds are, everybody's there working as one diverse team. While one of the next women headed to the International Space Station talks about the future. Good evening, I'm Walter Cronkite. And on this eve of man's first flight toward a landing on the moon, all preparations go smoothly. The weather prediction, along with the help of astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins, seem coordinated with that giant Saturn V for a go at 9.32 Eastern Daylight Time tomorrow morning. CBS Television's color coverage will begin at 6 a.m. Here's 11 things you may not know about the Apollo 11 mission. This is CBS News color coverage of Man on the Moon. The moon landing was must-see TV. About 600 million people tuned in to watch it live. When the Eagle landed in the wrong spot, it overshot by four miles and almost landed in a crater. Armstrong was a civilian pilot, even though most of the Apollo astronauts were military. Stuck on the moon, it could have happened if it wasn't for Buzz Aldrin using his felt tip pin to fix the liftoff switch. The crew did leave something behind medals to honor the victims of the Apollo 1 fire. Aldrin conducted the first communion on the moon, but NASA chose not to broadcast it because of protests. They've got the flag up now and you can... And you know that famous flag the astronauts planted? Well, it was designed specifically so it could fly in space. What about life insurance? The astronauts signed a bunch of postcards before they left for their families to sell as collector's items. And they weren't the only ones preparing. President Nixon had two speeches ready, one to celebrate and one if it ended in disaster. But when the astronauts got back, they did have something to declare. They jokingly filled out customs forms and listed moon rocks. Houston, we have a problem. And finally, are you a fan of the movie Apollo 13? Well, Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes were the backup crew for Apollo 11. And that's 11 facts about Apollo 11. You are about to meet a stickler for details. A Houston man who makes sure that when it comes to the moon and space travel, people get their facts straight. So they came down in the Sea of Tranquility or Mare Tranquilatus. Robert Perlman would love to go to the moon. But for now, he settles for being a space historian. Apollo 11, Houston, we are go for undocking, over. Roger, understand. Perlman's expertise and knowledge is why the director of the Apollo 11 documentary turned to him as a consultant to keep things historically accurate. A few months into the project, they got an email from someone at the National Archives that would change everything. He was definitely excited in this email saying that he had found this stash of 70 millimeter or large format, people know it as IMAX format film that was labeled Apollo 11. Had no idea what was on it, but were we interested? Go, Fido, go, guide, go, control, go. It turned out to be a hidden gem. 
never before seen high quality film of the mission. It is as clear and crisp and colorful as anything that you could shoot with today's modern cameras. The six minute mark in our countdown for Apollo 11. Now five minutes, 52 seconds. The result leaves the viewer feeling like this didn't happen 50 years ago. Instead, that it's happening right now. We have some 7.6 million pounds of thrust pushing the vehicle upward. The film also shows the crowd, an estimated 1 million people who traveled to Florida to see the launch for themselves. In the crowd, a lot of VIPs and celebrities, Vice President Agnew and The Tonight Show's Johnny Carson. One of the brilliant things that the cameraman did back then was that they turned the cameras on the people. So we get to see this slice of life from 1969. Eagle Houston, everything's looking good here, over. Roger, copy. It keeps you on the edge of your seat, even though you know the ending, in what many consider man's greatest achievement. I hope that Apollo 11, um, the film, will inspire us to, rem or remind us as a nation, that when we put our minds together and we work together, that we can achieve just about anything, everything. Inspiration from 50 years ago, calling mankind forward again. The Apollo program sent 24 astronauts into space, including Walt Cunningham. He helped pave the way to the first steps on the moon. They sent me a copy of that paper. And as a child, you used to deliver paper for the evening outlook. And oh, yes, yes, I was, I delivered it for, you know, two or three years. But the paper boy has gone far since childhood to the stars, in fact. It's a shame it's faded out a little bit because that's the Saturn 1B. Four, three, two, we have ignition. Commit liftoff, we have liftoff. The first mission of the Apollo program to carry a crew into space and Walt Cunningham was strapped in. Our focus on that countdown was to really do a good job with the spacecraft. Apollo 7 was critical for the space program. It was the first manned flight to be attempted since NASA's tragedy 21 months before. The fire that claimed the lives of Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Chaffee. NASA was counting on Apollo 7 to get them back on track in its quest for the moon. Knew that we had to do well, and we thought that we were able to do almost anything that was necessary. Uh, so we weren't focused on trying to keep from being killed like our crew before us. Cunningham was part of a three-man crew that included Don Isley and Commander Wally Shira. Their mission was to test the Apollo Command and Service Module in low Earth orbit. It seems like it's tight quarters for three people. It was, yeah. It, 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 and that's what that's hard for people to understand. Tight quarters, and to make matters worse, Commander Wally Shira had a head cold, which can be bad on Earth, but even worse in the pressure of a sealed capsule in space. Shira was congested and perhaps cranky, butting heads with mission control during the mission. Back in those days of the space program, when it was fresh and new and young, uh, there was competition going on between mission control and the crews. Despite that, the crew got its work done, including the first live television broadcast from space. For that, Cunningham was actually given an Emmy Award. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we were we were shocked. To us, it was just another piece of, of, of duty, a job, what we were doing. And what a job they did on Apollo 7. It was the, the longest, the most ambitious, the most successful first test flight of any new flying machine ever. Less than a year later, Apollo 11 would realize the dream in full and Neil Armstrong would be the first man to step foot on the lunar surface. And now we have two Americans on the moon. What did Cunningham think when he saw it on TV? My thought was, oh, I wish that was me. Uh, and I, I, by that time, I had figured out some of the politics and other things are going, going on, and I knew that that was not a, a fair concern for me. Cunningham would never walk on the moon, but he's thankful he had a major role in getting us there. Not bad for someone who started out as a paper boy. Eagle Houston, you're a go for landing, over. During the Apollo mission, there weren't many women working at NASA. There was one woman who worked in mission control at JSC. Poppy Northcutt calculated the moves that would bring those astronauts home. 
Her role in history is inspiring others. It was also an opportunity, I felt, to encourage other women to go into science and technology and understand that women could do these jobs. I got letters from all over the world from little girls and boys saying, I didn't know women could do this. NASA has changed since the Apollo missions. Women are taking a prominent role in space exploration. And one of them you're about to meet is headed to the International Space Station. Search Astro Jessica on Twitter and Instagram, and you'll find behind the scenes videos and photos posted by NASA astronaut Jessica Muir. Right, I hope that it does inspire and stimulate young girls to strive toward careers in the STEM field. As a little girl who grew up in northern Maine, Jessica I was affectionately known as Space Girl to my family. fell in love with nature and found inspiration in the night sky. And this September, after six years of training, Jessica will launch into space. The Soyuz spacecraft will transport her to the International Space Station, where she will do research for up to six months. Her crewmates are from Russia and the United Arab Emirates. I hope that for all the children and people growing up and adults too, when they're seeing that, we're seeing a well-integrated team from a diversity of backgrounds. 50 years after the lunar landing, you'll find more diversity at NASA, more engineers, more researchers, more astronauts who all look like more of us. No matter what we look like, where we came from, what our backgrounds are, everybody's there working as one diverse team. In outer space, and here in the space city. Jessica helped her friends rebuild after Harvey, and with dreams of visiting Mars and landing on the moon, she plans to keep Houston on the horizon. The opportunities for all of us are out there now, and all you need to do is really set your sights on those, what really drives you, what you're passionate about, and work hard toward it. And when you achieve it, be prepared to soak in the moment. The one thing that I've always dreamed about is just that image of looking back at our planet. Everywhere you've been, everybody you know, everything you've ever experienced is down there in its entirety and you're suddenly on the outside of it with only a handful of other people. So I think that that moment will really be quite profound for me because I've thought about it so much in my life. The youngest of five, while in space, Jessica knows she'll miss her family, her favorite foods, and fresh air. I'm really interested to see what I do miss the most. I'm not sure that I can really anticipate it. I know. I feel like you'd also go through like all of your books faster than you normally would. Like you get caught up on everything, do your taxes early, <laughs> all sorts of random things because you don't have to sit in Houston traffic. <laughs> I am very much looking forward to not sitting in Houston traffic. Yes, I will not miss that. And for that, I'd be like, take us with you. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Muir, the next generation of NASA. Still to come, the future of space travel to the moon, a look inside the Orion. How a Houston company is building a moon lander for NASA. And how a local school is teaching space architecture. President Nixon waving to the astronauts. The curtains have been drawn. And there they are in the rear, rear window. The president signaling for applause from the crowd. The astronauts gather in the window. Neil, Buzz, and Mike. I want you to know that I think I'm the luckiest man in the world. And I say this not only because I have the honor to be president of the United States, but particularly because I have the privilege of uh, speaking for so many and welcoming you back to Earth. One giant leap. We did it in 1969 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, and we're going to do it again. NASA is planning to put a man and woman on the moon in 2024, an ambitious plan that is going to take a lot of work and support. This is Orion, NASA's first design of a deep space crew capsule since the Apollo era. The spaceship astronauts have been evaluating what NASA has been testing all the way to splashdowns. We got to see up close at the Johnson Space Center. We put these on to make sure when we're getting in and out, since we're not astronauts, we don't hurt ourselves. We are not astronauts, yes. yeah. Okay, all right. From the outside, Orion looks similar to Apollo's capsule. Come on down into the step. But climb inside. 
Mark Kirisich oversees NASA's Orion program. The capsule is 50 percent bigger than Apollo's, roomy enough for four astronauts. So you'll be the pilot today, I'll be the commander. At eye level, a 21st century space dashboard. Just one example of how this moonshot will be different. When we went last time, the goal was land a person on the moon and return them safely to Earth, and we did that. This time it's a little bit different. It's about a sustainable, long-term human space exploration program. Orion would launch on top of an SLS rocket designed to be more powerful than the Apollo-era Saturn V. Its destination, a mini space station orbiting the moon called Gateway. Orion's crew would dock there and take a lunar lander down to the moon's surface. A handful of companies are now proposing designs for Gateway. Watch your head. Frank DeMauro showed us Northrop Grumman's mock-up of a Gateway habitat. He oversees space systems for the company. So when the Orion is here, uh, this would be open uh, for the crew to go back and forth. Up to four astronauts could work and live here for up to two months. So if you look up here, that's a berth that uh, a crew member would go in when it's time to go to sleep. The Apollo astronauts were basically living out of their car to and from the moon. This is more of a home. It's a place where they can cook their food, where they can gather and socialize, but really do their work. But Orion and the SLS rocket are years behind schedule and billions over budget. In March, the Trump administration, fed up, ordered NASA to put Americans back on the moon by 2024. If NASA is not currently capable of landing American astronauts on the moon in five years, we need to change the organization, not the mission. NASA did just that last week, ousting the top two managers of the Artemis program. It was entirely my decision, but at the end of the day, um, we need to make, be very clear that NASA is committed to cost and schedule. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine says it could take 20 billion additional dollars over five years to meet that new deadline. My next step is to get the support from the United States Congress. How realistic is it that we're going to have people on the moon by 2024? Well, I, I think it's realistic. If the Congress follows what we have put forward, uh, we will have the first woman and the next man on the moon in 2024. There are a lot of unknowns and challenges going to the moon. In the past, NASA handled it. But this time, it is a team effort between government and private companies. Leading the way in this partnership is one local company that is building a moon lander. For decades, NASA designed, built, and perfected each piece of masterful machinery on their own. And liftoff. Now, the space agency isn't building. They're buying. To discharge both sides. But that doesn't mean Houston has lost its stamp on spaceflight. Space City's intuitive machines is pushing the limit. In the air. You know, fly for a thousand miles on a single tank of gas. That's amazing. In the machine shop. And in space. We have an incredible 1,700 kilogram lander that's going to land on the moon as one of the first commercial companies back to the moon. It's called Nova Sea. Industry doubters said the company with less than 100 employees couldn't build it for less than $100 million. The doubters were wrong. Let's take a look. It uses an innovative LOX methane, liquid oxygen propulsion system that has never flown in space before by any other company. That's our invention. Intuitive Machines has pushed the boundary of what's possible to solve real world problems, but arguably its greatest accomplishment is keeping Houston in space. Houston will have to feed this workforce to build more for NASA and commercial companies. We have an education pipeline at the University of Houston with the nation's only space architecture degree. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. We know how the Eagle has landed. to get to the moon. They're setting up the flag now. But how do we stay there permanently? You can see the stars and stripes. To pull it off, NASA needs educated minds. The physical lander lives on my desktop right now. <laughs> Tyler Gilliland is 26 years old. I try to be humble. <laughs> Two decades ago, he watched planes in the New Mexico desert and dreamt of landing on the moon. So I think that was the moment I knew. Gilliland chased his dreams to the world's only Master of Science degree in space architecture program. Hidden gem, yes, I would probably say that. Of course, at the University of Houston. Our students base their designs on uh, real 
knowledge and real technology. Dr. Olga Benova's space architecture program, known as SIXA, teaches students to make human spaceflight and space settlements possible. They're coming out prepared for that type of environment and they're not afraid to speak up. I'm living my dream job. Gilliland helped plan this Mars settlement before graduating and getting his first job building our next lunar lander with Houston-based Intuitive Machines. If I didn't go through six and I didn't go through, you know, I didn't get this internship, I wouldn't be living the dream. Right now, we don't know who will be going to the moon, but we do know that they will all have Houston connections. They will train at Johnson Space Center. That's where every one of NASA's astronauts learn how to be space explorers. Before Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took one giant step, they took baby steps in Houston. If we have to use this uh, in the lunar surface, uh, I won't have that antenna sticking up. This is video taken on April 18th, 1969, when the two men were training in a lunar surface simulation. And when that baby is riding right in the center, that means the whole package is level. This is just a fantastic and exciting period of time. I'm going to grab this. Celebrating the 50-year anniversary of landing on the moon, and it gives all of us a chance to look back at the videos. How did the astronauts train to land on the moon? For 20 years, Lucia McCullough has been in the business of training astronauts at the Johnson Space Center. And I've been so impressed by the kinds of events that we do now that they were already pioneering 50 years ago. And so we've been able to refine that over time. Houston is home to the astronaut corps, so every man or woman who blasts off spends time at JSC learning how to live and work in space. You know that space flight is going to feel different than a walk through the park. <laughs> and so you um, start to figure out in what ways is it going to be different and what do I need to do to prepare myself so that we just hit the mission right out of the park. Training is mental and physical and differs mission to mission, but everyone gets the basics, like how to walk in space, how to be weightless, and how to be in a confined spot. They live it so many times that they just adapt to the environment. Even though it's five years away, McCullough is already prepping for the next trip to the moon by reflecting on past missions. We've all been looking back at the history documents and thought about how did that team manage the mission, mission risks, and we are using all of the experience and lessons learned from that series of missions so that we can look at the future through the wisdom that we've gained from the past. Still to come, how space travel is creating new technology for us here on Earth. Plus, a final look back at the Apollo 11 mission and the landing on the moon. It's hard to give a, a single reaction after such a fantastic uh, feat. And my first reaction is happiness at the uh, safety of these three great astronauts, Aldrin and Collins and Armstrong, what a wonderful a performance they made and what a great credit not just to Texas because they live they live here but uh, to the whole whole country let's start with a brief history lesson in 1958 the space act passed it created NASA and stipulated that NASA's work should also help mankind. In other words, technologies used in space should be used here on Earth too. NASA calls them spin-offs. And I bet there are more Apollo era products in your life today than you think. There's the obvious, freeze dried food, but less obvious spin-offs are water filters and cordless vacuums. It's incredible how many things have been developed from astronaut spacesuits alone. I'm talking gas masks and fire resistant gear that firefighters wear all over the world. Runners, these next two are for you. Athletic shoes today use insoles inspired by moon boots. And you know those shiny thermal blankets handed out after big marathons? That's one of NASA's too. But one of the most visible spinoffs in Houston can be found at Texans home games. Spacesuit fabric was used to create a durable, lightweight, and strong building material. It's what NRG Stadium's retractable roof is made of. So see, 
it really did take rocket scientists to figure out some of the technologies we use every day. When the American flag was planted on the moon for the first time, it needed a special pole to hold it up. It turns out the man who invented it lives in Richmond, and he's sharing his story. You must be Dr. Parr. Well, I am. Home in Richmond, Texas, long retired. This is my command center. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you call it, really? It's what I call it. <laughs> it's mine. 89-year-old mechanical engineer Ken Parr. That's a, a safe. Is still an invent, fix up anything kind of guy. Oh, that is so cool. With out of this world creations, including the one still in orbit, he thinks. Trump said that he's going to send another team up there to the moon to see if the flag is still in the moon. Well, I can tell him that it is and save that money. Apollo 11, mankind's giant leap, planted America's flag on the moon and with it. Beautiful, just beautiful. Ken Parr's creation. A lot of our stuff came out on stamps. In 1953, between mechanical engineering classes at the University of Houston, Parr worked for a company called ESCO. Both believed NASA was onto something big and wanted in. They tackled jobs at the Astrodome and Astroworld to prove their worth. Parr's machinist work caught their eye. You see, ever since he molded that meat cleaver from aluminum in high school shop, this stuff felt like it's calling. It's making something from almost nothing, making something that's beautiful, that's useful, that fills a need for whatever you need at the time. In the height of the space race, NASA called ESCO often. We had to have 20 men on call at any given time to do anything they needed done day or night. But their biggest ask, 70, 75 aircraft aluminum, to build a flagpole for the first lunar landing, we had to make everything as light as possible, proved easy and life changing. That inspired me to do more. Parr's company made poles for Apollo 16, 17. They worked on the lunar rover and made the parasol that saved Skylab, NASA's first space station. How do you do something bigger than that? Presidents personally write to congratulate Parr and his wife of 70 years every wedding anniversary. Now owner of an honorary doctorate, he's building safes by the pile, mostly for people to lock up weapons, his response to a child's suicide close to his family. Selling them is the next step for a man used to reaching for the stars. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the anniversary of the first moon landing and Houston's role in it. We leave you tonight with a look back at the pictures and video of the historic milestone in space history. If all goes well, Apollo 11 astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins are to lift off from pad 39A out there on the voyage man always has dreamed about. Next stop for them, the moon. 10, 9, ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Looks like a good trajectory so far, doesn't it, Billy? Very good, very good. We're through the region of maximum dynamic pressure now. Same time, we're go. Altitude 1,600. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Straight shadow. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. The eagle has landed. We copy it down, eagle. Whew. Boy. <laughs> okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. Armstrong is on the moon. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American. And now we have two Americans on the moon. Armstrong and Aldrin uh, spent just under a full Earth day on the moon. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the lunar the up now. They picked at it and sampled it, and they deployed experiments on it. Houston, Roger, well done, out. Pack with them and bring on home. Splashdown should be just now. President Nixon seems genuinely moved by this moment. And here they come. From where they will be flown, quarantine station and all, to Houston. All of them in fine shape. Their dramatic face-to-face -face meeting with President Nixon. President Nixon waving to the astronauts. The curtains have been drawn. There they are in the rear, rear window. Speaking for so many and welcoming you back to Earth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things 
not because they are easy, but because they are hard.